What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Pick 6 Podcast. I'm Tyler Sullivan. No, not Will Brinson. I think he's out scalping for NC State March Madness tickets. At least that's my best estimation. But don't worry. I have Brady Quinn and Leger Doosable with me. Doosdays with Brady. And let me remind you that the episode of the Pick 6 Podcast is presented by FanDuel Sportsbook. Make every moment more. Fellas, how are we doing? Doing well. I mean, my bracket's busted, so I'm, I'm not oh, yeah. as lucky as Will Brinson at this point to have an 11 seed just climbing through in the Sweet 16. But hey, here we are. Dudes, how about you? How you? I doing? can't complain, man. Uh, it's been good. I can't complain, man. It's been good. You know, uh, watching a little bit of the tournament too, like everybody else. And hey, I got Brinson, his alma mater's, you know, going making a deep run, maybe in a Cinderella type run. So uh, we'll excuse him for today, I guess, Brady. The hilarious part is that he had NC State like nowhere in his bracket. I think it was like a one and done. That's about it. So props to him. We'll see if his uh, Cinderella story can no keep fake. going. No, fake. but it's a but it's a busy day in the NFL. I mean, Sunday, you had a bunch of teams and owners going to Orlando, Florida to have the annual league meeting. And there is just a lot of stuff coming out. And so there's a lot of things that are going to change the game on the field as on top of on the field. We talked a little bit about it yesterday but we're going to dive into it a little bit more specifically here with the new kickoff rules it, it's a mouthful and, and so we'll try not to go too in the weeds you know we'll get you some explainers here on the website but ultimately we saw last year that the nfl had the lowest kick return rate 22 percent in the modern era case in point not good can't have that it's basically a play now that's more ceremonial than anything else so there was going to be a change at some point now It's a pretty dramatic change, and if you follow the XFL over the last few years, that's essentially what the the league has adopted. And so I'll just go real quickly as a quick, quick breakdown. There's going to be 22 players on the field, and 21 of them are going to be in the receiving team's area of the field. The only person not in that spot is the kicker, of course. You're going to have the kickoff team lined up at the 40-yard line, five and five on each side, and you'll have the receiving team on the 35 yard line and you'll have two up to two players as receivers and you can go into the landing zone, which is essentially the red zone 20 yard line to the goal line. And there's a whole bunch of different aspects in terms of touchbacks and where the ball will be placed. It will give you a popsicle headache, but ultimately we want to talk to you guys about what this means for the NFL, what it means for the game. So, Brady, I'll start with you. Will these new kickoff rules make watching the kickoff better? They'll definitely make it more intriguing, I think, for the first year. They'll make watching it better because, to your point on the stat from last year, and really this has been a declining trend, I think, as we've tried to, to play with the kickoff uh, formations, the, the pre-kick kind of rules as far as how many players can line up on each side, no wedges, everything that goes along with it. It's become kind of an afterthought. And you know the NFL hates that. Very similar to the PAT, which became an afterthought, right? The touchdown scored. Everyone gets up to go to the concessions, to go to the bathroom, to go take a break from watching it on television because they assume the PAT was going to be made. They changed that rule. And now not so much due to player safety, but I think if you looked at that play, it was probably became more of a dangerous play than an influential play in any way. Now we've seen that change kind of the, you know, the, the course of kickers and some of the accuracy that we typically see with PATs. Similar fashion here with kickoffs now. We're looking at it saying to ourselves a few things. We feel like this formation pre-snap will make the play safer for all players involved, maybe with the exception of the returner. And on top of that, I think you get more returns. And let's not forget, this was a league last year that hit a record pace of unders during the course of the season. Had I was down in scoring, and that's been a concerning trend too. So how do you create you know, more scoring? You create a more advantageous field position for a touchback. You create more of an opportunity to get a return, one in which that might end up in an explosive play, end up in a big play, better field you know, position or starting field position. So all those things now are back part of the conversation, uh, and, and special teams becomes more involved, or at least more involved, involved piece of the game. So uh, I'm more curious than anything else as to how this will play out on a much larger scale than what we saw in the XFL. Uh, but I think it has taken out the element of surprise, dudes. You know, nowadays, if you're going to then go for an you know, onside kick I mean, or however, to how are we going to handle that? Go ahead, dudes. Yeah, to, to touch on that, Brady, I think you used the perfect word, element of surprise, because they've essentially mitigated that, right? Now you have to let the officials know, and it has to be late in the fourth quarter in, in regards to doing an onside kick. 
I think everybody remembered the excitement when the New Orleans Saints had that onside kick coming out at halftime versus the Indianapolis Colts and were able to get that return. So it mitigates that. So when I look at this new kickoff rule, right, I, I get what they're trying to do. They're trying to mitigate the big collisions and everything. I just think, Brady, that at times we forget this is a physical game and it's a violent game at times. And there was nothing more exciting than watching that opening kickoff when the Chicago Bears and Devin Hester took the opening kickoff to the house for a touchdown or even Desmond Howard. I thought maybe there could be a tweak of the rule where they maybe move the ball back because, Brady, we played in an era where they had the wedge, right, when there was four guys in the wedge and guys were running down on kickoff, running into that. And that's when you got a lot of those concussions and big injuries, but they already kind of mitigated that because there's no more wedges allowed, right? And there's no more blindside blocks. So my thing is, like, how are you going to keep changing and manipulating the rules in regards to taking the physicality out of the game? Yes, I get that you want to bring the kickoff return back into the game, and this is a way that you feel like could be maybe safer to do that. But why not just move the ball back five or ten yards from where the kickoff line is? Because, again, there is no more blindside blocks. There is no more wedge blocks. Yes, people do get hurt. It is football. But at what point are they going to take the physicalness out of football? I think one thing that's important to point out there, too, is that you will see more returns because there are no fair catches. I mean, that's something that we should highlight there. But I, I do like what you're saying, too. If you just move the ball back, I mean, we've seen these kickers just absolutely annihilated into the uprights and back of the end zone. So it's been just an absolute boring play over the last few years. As you mentioned, Brady, it was, you know, the time to go to the bathroom, time to go get a beer or whatever you wanted to do. Go get some more appetizers if you're hanging out with friends and family. It just became kind of a nothing play. I think that that might have been an interesting you know, alternate if you just moved the ball back in terms of where you kicked it. But ultimately, I do think you're definitely going to see more action with the play in terms of player safety. You guys can probably speak more to that. Yeah, no, I mean, clearly it's going to be a safer play in the context of you don't have guys who are much further apart who in one side, in one case for the return team is running backwards then to try to go block a guy who's been running for the past 40 yards at them full speed. So there's definitely an element to more player safety from that standpoint. I even think for the return man, outside of catching the football, fielding the football, uh, you're going to have a better sense for the blocking in front of you, right? I mean, they're not that far apart from one another. You know, as opposed to guys running with their backs turned to the guy they're blocking, then turning back around to get their head onto a swivel to go make that block on their designated player, where they may miss him the last second. Now you've got to make an adjustment as a returner. You're going to know which guy's free and which guy's probably covered up for the most part leading up to when you're fielding that ball. So that's one part of it. Dues, though, touched on something that I mentioned back when this rule was thrown out there uh, probably a month or so back. And I mentioned, hey, just move it back. That'd be the simplest form of keeping this. And it was more about, out of an effort to keep the onside kick element to this because if you don't not only are you taking out the surprise onside as deuce touched on but now we have to go about looking at how are we going about onside kicks are we just flat out giving up what we're saying and we're going to tell them hey this is how we're going to try to implement an onside kick with the way we're formationing things um you it's almost a throwaway at that point for that whole surprise element the mortar kick element a lot of the things that i think that you used to be able to see implemented uh, i'm sure special teams coaches will get creative with this but I think the whole element of scheme and strategy uh, is going to take a hit to some degree. And I know, again, we're doing it uh, over, over with the veil of player safety as part of this. I, I Again, I, I tend to disagree with, with others. Like, I didn't think that was overly necessary considering even though it's uh, considered an unsafe play, play for the rate of recussion per actual return, again, returns were down. And if you're trying to get more returns, simply move it back. That will be the simplest way of fixing all this. Now, let me let me ask you this quick question, because I think you kind of touched on something there. Like, you know, you, you have to now signal for the onside kick or it just kind of takes away that element of surprise. Is this the NFL maybe tipping their hand a little bit, dudes, that we could be seeing that fourth and 20, that fourth and 25 conversion that everybody's talked about over the last few years in terms of an onside kick? I'll say it one more time, Tyler. Saying, is this now possibly a precursor to seeing the elimination of the onside kick, and now we see that fourth and twenty type of type of opportunity for these teams. I think it just depends on how this new kickoff rule plays out throughout this season, right? Because we talked about it earlier. Now the surprise element is gone, so that like as far as the strategy from special teams coaches, that hurts and negates them stealing an extra possession. You know this, Brady. Offensive coaches are always trying to steal an extra offensive possession, and now 
there is no element to that because of this new kickoff rule. So I know that was brought up the fourth and 20 attempt to potentially try to get the ball back if you're down in the game. And I believe it was shot down, if I'm not mistaken. It depends on how things play out throughout the rest of the season. I want to touch on something that Brady said, too, when he talked about the strategy of certain coaches now with the new rules, um, because there's there's so so many things to dive into, right? You talked about it, Brady. The team, the returning team is only going to be essentially five yards away from the kickoff team, right? And then nobody can move until the actual returner catches the ball or the ball lands in the landing zone. This is my question. Isn't it kind of subjective then in regards to when the kickoff team can actually take off? Because, Brady, you know this as a D lineman and, and players, period. We, we try to get every advantage possible. So how tightly are they going to watch the kickoff team leaving the line of scrimmage in regards to where the ball is landing in the landing zone or whether the guy is catching the ball? And I saw I looked up some XFL clips. Also, there are certain teams that actually had their return team that was blocking look back at the returners to know when they can go. Other teams, they just heard the, the ball hit his chest or the return guy would give a call. There's just so many nuances. And then there's another element to this, right? Because a few years ago, teams started doing this sky kick where they would put the ball really high in the air, right? Force teams to do the onside kick. You would think there'd be an element with that too. And how does that, you know, throw off the timing of the return game as well when you kick the ball up that high in the air, especially if a return man has to run a good bit of distance to catch up to see where the ball is. So, I think I'm like Brady. I think they should just try to move the ball back five, maybe even seven yards. And because they already kind of took out some of those head-to-head -head collisions with the, the the wedge being taken out and also the blind side block. Only time will tell how this rule will will play out throughout this season. We saw the XFL do they had some success with it. I just think the excitement of the play is gone compared to when guys are running down the field 40 or 50 yards. You know what I'm gonna miss, guys? I'm going to miss guys like dudes, all right? Because sometimes he had to be back there, right, as, as part of the old school days, yeah. part of the wedge or old school days, just one of the bigger guys who's back there helping to create a path for the return, man. But every once in a while, you get that squib kick and you get the big guy back there and it, the ball goes right <laughs> to him and dudes is picking it up. Now he's running. And now you're going to yeah. bring down a big boy running down the field on special teams. That's what I'm going to miss because you don't get an element of that now with the way this setup's going to be. It's just two return men back there. So I am going to sadly miss the big boy return that we used to get back on those kind of swim kicks where they try to muddy it up, make it look all messy with guys like dudes back there returning the football. And I, I love seeing the big men show off their athleticism when they're back there returning the, the football, usually in special teams play. Or every once in a while, I see like a fumble where they pick it up and they start rumbling, bumbling, stumbling. Like I'm going to miss those days. You know, one of my favorite clips of the Patriots run was Dan Connolly on Sunday Night Football. The big loaf of bread running I down the Dan field. Dan Connolly was the one that comes to mind for sure. A, phen a phenomenal moment. Uh, you know, and you're right. We are we are going to lose that. Now, it's, let's quickly point out here that this is under a one-year review. So if we are sitting here a year from now, let, let's kind of just quickly go yes or no. Is this implementation of the kickoff rule going to be triggered permanently going into 2025? Brady, we'll start with you. Yes, because I think you're going to see more returns. And I think that's the goal is they don't want to have to change the what we call the uh, a football game, right? Everyone's there for kickoff at this time. Kickoff is at this time. There's no way they're going to eliminate this play altogether. Otherwise, we're going to have to change our entire vernacular. It's already hard enough having to adjust to the <laughs> Los Angeles Chargers or the Las Vegas Raiders. For, for many of us, we've been you know in the NFL or following the NFL for such a long period of time. I mean, heck, Pete Prisco still can't get it right half the time that the Chargers are in L.A. and they're not in San Diego anymore. Deuce, thumbs up, thumbs down. You think this is staying or is it going to be eliminated by the this time next year? Thumbs down. I think it's going to be a one-year trial run. I think eventually they'll get back to the other kickoff. The interesting thing is, even watching some of the XFL returns, uh, again, I think the excitement element just wasn't there. And there was a few times where guys actually broke you know, free and either either scored a touchdown or had a long return. So when you look at the rate in regards to guys actually scoring touchdowns or kickoff return, I would say I don't think it was that far off compared to what the NFL was was getting. Now, again, there were more returns, but guys were getting tackled because of the space being so close. So uh, when you look at it, I think the NFL only had four kickoff returns for touchdowns last year, uh, which was significantly down. But it, again, the excitement of being able to have guys run down or kick off. And Brady knows this. that's the first play of the game, like that starts the game. That usually gets everybody's juices flowing. 
I don't know how much excitement you'll get from guys being five yards apart, one team running back five yards to block another team, or maybe not even running back. They might run right at the team to try to block them, and the return are only being about 15 yards away. I just think the excitement of the play, it won't last in the NFL. I think this will be a one-year trial, year, uh, one year trial run for the NFL. One thing I do think you'll see, Tyler, is from my understanding and watching the XFL, it felt like there was a lot more sideline returns uh, with this format, with this setup. It felt like you don't, you quite, you know, can't quite get set up a lot of those middle returns where there, there's either a little bit of misdirection by the return man or some cross blocking the way it could be set up, even under the new rules, to create more of a, a middle return uh, or a left middle, right middle, however you look at it. It feels like things usually get kind of strung out where the ball ends up kind of finding its way to the sideline either way. So there might be more returns. It might be more more accustomed to the sideline returns of anything else. Yeah, it's definitely going to be interesting to see how all these teams kind of adjust to these new rules. All right, when we come back, we have more news yeah. coming out of Florida, including on the defensive side of the ball, something we touched on a little while ago. We'll talk about that coming up next. You came down here to tell us that your date is missing. I did not get ghosted. I think he was taken. You were dating as a way to face your divorce. Was I really the only thing holding you together, dude? Damn. Ready or not, I am in search of a man with whom I had a beautiful connection. You can't hide. If anything feels off, we'll go. Off, off. Murderer. Who are you? Diara. Diara? Diara. The kickoff rule was definitely the most viral news to come out of the owners' meetings, but there was another one on the defensive side of the ball. It's something that we talked about with the three of us when I was last hosting, the hip drop tackle. The NFL has since banned that form of tackling. The new rule states that the referee will issue a 15-yard penalty with an automatic first down for a tackle, quote, when a player grabs the runner with both hands or wraps the runner with both arms, and B, unweighs himself by swiveling and dropping his hips and or lower body, landing and trapping the runner's legs at or below the knee. Very specific. I didn't even know unweighed themselves was an actual word, but apparently it is according to the NFL. So, dudes, is this specific enough? Does the language actually indicate that this is what they want to happen? Just give me your just first thoughts on all this. Tyler and Brady, this is ridiculous. This, this is ridiculous. And again, I know people will say you're a defensive minded guy. We know the league is offensive based. They want more scoring and everything. And this is another rule that is slanted on the offensive side. But Brady, how are defense defenders supposed to do their job? Right. Because say you're next to a guy or he's even in front of you. How do you tackle him and slow him down to prevent him getting extra yards? Without, as Tyler would say, they said, unweight yourself. I, like, like you, I didn't know that was a word until yesterday that they started using that word unweight yourself. That's a new term for me. So is hip drop is a new term for me as well. Because to me, that was always just a regular tackle. Like the, people talk about the Mark Andrews injury. And if you look at it, Logan Wilson was in the pile with everybody else. He was, you know, getting out of the stack of the pile, trying to run Mark Andrews down. And he literally was behind him. How else is he supposed to stop Mark Andrews from getting extra yards without dropping his weight to bring him down? I get you want to minimize and mitigate injuries in the NFL. But like I was saying about the kickoff rule, we, we tend to forget this is a physical game. This is why people love this game so much, because it differs from so many other sports that people watch. The physical nature, the warrior nature, and that, that is getting taken out of this game. It's already so hard. To play defense, you talk. We talked about this before, Brady. Like after five yards, DBs can't touch receivers, right? Now DBs can't even cut offensive tackles out in the open space, right? But yet on the offensive line on the backside, offensive tackles can still cut defensive linemen, right? Again, something slanted toward, towards the offense. And then the rule that every, that had everybody up in arms was the rough and the passer rule, right? And I think it's because it's subjective, right? There's no clear cut black and white rule to where a ref should or shouldn't call something. That's the same thing with this. It's subjective to the ref. And you put the refs in a terrible position to make potential calls because they don't know the black and white rule to this as well. Not only that, Brady and Tyler, that the NFL talked about finding players for, for making this tackle, for doing their regular job, taking food off their plate. So, uh, again, this is ridiculous. Brady, you brought up something that was really good earlier in the show, saying how the scoring was down. And I think – this is part of another reason to get more points up because, you know, once you get this personal foul, 
you get a 15 yard penalty and you get a first down, which means they get another bite of the apple on offense, which gives the offense another possession on the field. So uh, as a defender, I don't even know how guys are supposed to, to do their jobs because not now they're thinking Brady instead of just playing and reacting off of instinct. They're thinking, how do I tackle this guy? Because if I tackle him the wrong way, not only am I hurting my team, I'm losing money in my pocket to provide for my family. Yeah, it, it's it's really forcing defenders once again to have to adjust for the sake of player safety. And um, that seems to be the route that the NFL always goes. Um, it's a bit lazy. I think when you look at it, you know, Deuce and Sully, you'd have to understand how do we get here? The game's more spread out than it's ever been before. And because of that, you get more angle tackles. These angle tackles have led to defenders who already aren't tackling as well as they used to back in the old days, in part because they're going up against more skilled defenders in space. That, that's a piece of it but also because we don't have as much hitting as we used to. It's not as a trained technique the same way we used to, and we're teaching it a different way. We're teaching more of a rugby-style tackle, and that rugby-style tackle that the NFL was, was basically so adamant to introduce back after 2010 when all this uh, all the storylines came out about CTE and the fear for the, the long-term you know, of, of the league remaining intact and, and uh, correlating it with head injuries and CTE and football and the way we we're tackling. It's led us to this rugby style tackle. We're trying to take the head out of football. Well, unfortunately, that's now led us to the hip drop tackle because guys are taking angles that force them to have to put their head on one side or the other when they're using their shoulders and they're trying to wrap and roll. Well, if you end up, you know, picking wrong and the defender's ahead of you, or, or excuse me, the ball carrier's ahead of you, and you put your your head opposite on his backside of it, you have you can you can't do anything else other than try to grab onto that ball carrier, use all of your weight to stop his momentum moving forward since you're not in front of him and try to bring him down. And that's really the job of any defender. So uh, it's it's tough, especially when you see the NFLPA came out against this in the first place, which you very rarely see when it comes to a player safety issue. I know there's a lot of players who are advocating for this, being penalized, being outlawed. The reality is, is where does it stop? It's going to be really, really hard for defenders to do their job in the future and not get penalized or not get fined. And it only leads to more subjectivity amongst officials that leads to more frustration amongst the fans. Well, well, not only where it stops, but what and is the Tyler, domino effect? Go. I was thinking to add, oh, go to ahead, add go this ahead, part, dude. right? Now, now, guys, instead of, like you said, Brady, guys are going to be shooting at ankles and knees and, and trying to roll instead of trying to bring guys down with the quote-unquote exactly. hit drop tackle. So I, we saw it, Brady. I also saw that you re reposted um, Jonu Smith. He said, you know, we're fine, you know, with the rule. He's like, we will not need to change the rules change the turf on the field instead, instead of the hip drop tackle. Because I think players understand more so receivers and tight ends that now guys are going to adjust, right? Now they're going to be diving at ankles and knees and rolling. And as a player on the offensive side, you're worried about your long-term health because guys are thinking how they should tackle guys instead of just acting off of instinct and doing what comes naturally. So I, I would not be surprised. Again, I don't want to put this in the air, but, you know, injuries could potentially even go up now because now guys – not only don't want to hurt their team, they don't want to get fined and lose money. So now, by the letter of the law, they're going to just start going low on guys. Yeah, dude, you, you took the words right out of my mouth. I think that that's exactly where we're kind of trending. You, Brady, you were talking about they want to eliminate head injuries, and then you go down to the hip, and now where are we at? We're at knees and ankles, and that's something that could be really detrimental for, for players on, on all sides here. The one thing that I thought was interesting is that it, the, the league doesn't believe that it will be flagged that much do we believe them or do we think that this is something that we're going to see a lot every Sunday? And that's the hard part is it depends on the officiating crew, right? Yeah. You know, we have some officiating crews who we all look at holding. We all can tell what holding is, but during the course of a game and in, in an instant, you have to make a call whether or not really that holding impacted the play. Like that's the interpretation of it is if it's on the backside of a, an outside run to the right and it's on the left-hand side of the offensive line, probably not calling it if they don't feel like it impacted the play in any way. But if it's to that right side on an outside zone where it, you know, it forces, uh, you know, the, the defender not to be able to make the tackle and, and it ends up leading to it, you gain in yards. Yeah. You're probably getting that flag, but again, it depends on the crew we're talking about. So that's the tough part is we always see these rules put in print, how they're then applied becomes something else. And I think the, the one thing I'm a little bit curious about, and I know this is the first year for this rule, so this is probably why they're not doing it, is if you dive into what they did with intentional grounding and what they did with, uh, you know, for example, roughing the passer, they've allowed the NFL replay assistant yeah. to basically correct the call. 
that should be what the NFL is focusing on. That should be where the NFL is trying to eliminate any sort of subjectivity out of a lot of the officiating in the NFL and apply that to almost every call, if you can. Very similar to college football on how they've implemented the replay process. Call it player safety, call it whatever you want, but the reality is these officials need help in real time, especially as they continue to create more and more rules in limiting what players can do. Yeah, no, I, I think that that's going to be pretty interesting here. And you kind of just brought into our next segment here, talking about that replay with the, it's not only the roughing the passer and, and all of that, but it's also the play clock and all of that. So how do you think that this overall just changes the game and how it's going to be officiated? Again, do you just think it's a crew by crew thing? Or do you think that this is a little bit more uniformed in, to how we're going to see the NFL be called? I, I think what the cause and effect of any implementation of replay is that officials are going to let plays go that are reviewable. At least they should. That's typically what they're being coached to do or the mechanics of the officiating. Now, Dean Blandino and Mike Pereira might disagree with what I'm saying this, but I've watched enough football to see that at times they will let plays play out because they know they can rely on replay to help bail them out in that scenario. You see it in college football. You'll see it from time to time in the NFL. It's one of the reasons why, again, I think I'd like to see more jurisdiction under the replay assistant to be a part of that process because then at least we know every single officiating crew can rely on that and they're probably going to call it see it very similar knowing they can rely on replay to be able to fix it now the question becomes how do we expedite or, or make more efficient the replay process again i keep going back to college football because they've been able to have a little more practice with this having a replay assistant at each game being able to you know comb through a bunch of plays scoring plays turnovers targeting Maybe targeting is not the best example of that, but it's a slowdown process because you might be ejecting a player sometimes, but they still, in large part, do a very you know quick job or fast job of making a decision on whatever that play was based on the call on the field. The NFL could implement something very similar. I don't know that it's really going to change the pace of the game a whole lot, but I think how they implement it would be one in which they kind of teach the officials, we understand we still give you a ton of power and control on the field, but that replay assistant is there for you utilize them in instances where it does feel a little bit gray out there. And then dues, you know, we hear this all the time, you know, it's yeah, purely and, objective. And Brady, like, oh, go, so ahead, much go, ahead, it. And, uh, go ahead, Tyler. No, I was just going to ask you, we hear purely objective. We hear clear and obvious. Yeah, what I was gonna say. Go right ahead. Go, go for it. Go. What you're going to say with. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, no I was going to say so much for for the NFL talking about not extending the game, right, Brady? Um, because you know, with this extra challenge, which again, I I agree with, because if you get one out of two right, I feel like you should be allotted an extra one, um, just because of the hit rate. It's so subjective on whether a ref will overturn a call or not, right? And, and that's the the issue with challenges when some of those calls are subjective. Like it just depends on what the ref thinks it is, or even the people that they're talking to in the replay booth. It's not to the letter of the law or black and white. So I think they should get an extra one. But I remember the NFL talking about not wanting to slow the game down. But yet here we are. I think it's always more important to get it right than worry about the actual length of the game. Yeah, no, I, I and we're going to talk about, you know, kind of the length of game and the NFL not wanting to extend it in a little bit. But I do think we should probably focus more on pace than we would length of games you know you were saying you were talking about it Brady like you know as long as you can have expedited review processes I don't really have a huge problem with them going to the booth but if we get to these scenarios where we're kind of all sitting around and wondering okay what's taking so long you know I don't know if a shot clock or anything like that for an official makes sense but you know what I mean whatever goes moves the game along quickly I think is the best thing going forward yeah, I don't know if you want a shot clock on some, some of these guys. You know, they might feel a little bit too much pressure to make a call. Not about <laughs> right, right, right. Just, you know, freak out. The other thing is, as far as the mechanics behind the process, just so people know at home, you know, when you're a part of a TV crew, the officiating crew is using your, your array of cameras to then figure out the best angle to review something to sometimes piece together the right call or try to see if they can overturn a call uh, or, or maybe there's something there, right, if it's challenged. So, um, that's the other hard part about it is it's not always on the officials as part of this review process. Sometimes it's on the TV networks. Sometimes it's on the truck. Sometimes it's on technology to be able to find the angle that they're looking for, run it back, run it back. Let's go back and see it. Um, sometimes these TV trucks are, are kind of old, not to like put anyone on blast, all right? But the reality is sometimes the technology doesn't work as fast as we're accustomed to at home. So 
that becomes part of the uh, the issue with expediting that that review process sometimes to make sure we're not waiting. It's it's really not the official's fault at times. It's just a, a matter of technology, and we're just not quite there in regards to uh, all the technology behind the scenes with a lot of the networks. Yeah, and again, we're talking about, you know, uh, one of the new rule changes that we've seen is that the NFL, those were proposed by Dan Campbell and the Detroit Lions, that, you know, typically you had to get both challenges correct for you to be rewarded the third. Now you only just need one. And I do think that that is an important rule change, dudes, right? Yeah, I do, just because, like what I was saying, um, and Brady, you know, explained it really well as far as the different camera angles everybody has. But at the end of the day, it's still subjective to what that person that the ref is talking to calls, right? So, like, if you get one out of two right, I think you deserve an extra challenge just because half of America will look at the play and be like, well, it definitely was, you know, when they were challenging pass interference, they'll say it was pass interference. The other half will say it wasn't pass interference. So, like, my thing is if you get one out of the two right, like, it's hard to get two out of two right, especially when – it's not in your hands. It's it's up to somebody else to make that decision. So I, I love that Dan Campbell decided to bring this to the forefront front and the Detroit Lions because I think you do deserve an extra challenge if you get one out of two right. Because, again, the hit rate in regards – like there will be times, I'm sure, Brady, you can speak to this too, where you see a call on the, on the, on the field and when you look at the challenge, like, oh, they're definitely overturning that, and it doesn't get overturned. So, like, my thing is if a coach does get it right and they do overturn it, then yes, they deserve another challenge. Yeah, there's no disagreement with that. You know, I think if you're looking at the ability to get a challenge right, oftentimes, you know, they should be awarded just if they get one right to get the third one. And then how it plays a factor in the second half of a game uh, plays into the the gamesmanship, the schematics of, of when you challenge the first time, how you go about challenging which plays and all that. So uh, I've no I've no qualms with this. You know, again, I'm, I'm the type that I, I don't think coaches are going to use challenges all the time. If we give them an unlimited you know, source of challenges. I don't think any uh, head coach, any coordinator wants to be challenging every single, you know, play that's constantly out there. Um, you know, so if, if there's a concern about the pace of play from that standpoint, I don't I don't see it happening quite as much. Um, so again, not as big of a, a deal for me. I think the NFL replay assistant and it being able to correct some of the, uh, the you know, intentional grounding, roughing the pass or penalties, that's a much bigger deal. I don't think it's getting as as, um, applauded as much amongst the masses in the media for for the NFL kind of slowly going in that direction of making a, a pretty monumental change in, in my estimation of how things are going to be officiated moving forward. Also with the play clock too as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's well, part I mean, of it. You know, you'll see, you'll see a lot. And I felt like that was a lot more of the conversation last year too. I felt like there were a number of scenarios where the play clock was, you know, at zero, then it's a little bit longer, and then all of a sudden the snap gets off, and there's a monumental play. I mean, you know, you could end up seeing things erased too. Like, you know, go back to that Bills Chiefs game where Kadarius Tony was lined up offsides. Like, it's not a perfect example, but you have this monumental play. Things were logistically weren't right pre snap, and things go awry from there. So I do think that, like you're saying, Brady, I do think that this is one of those things that not a lot of people are talking about but could have huge impacts on specific big plays in the league. And, and to your point about the play clock, you know, really when it gets down close to zero, if you talk to any edge rusher, a lot of times if they're aware of that play clock going down or if they have a blitz on, they're going to be, you know, licking their chops, watching that, kind of paying attention to then, to then break on it because they know once that thing hits zero – they, the snap has to come, so they know they can get a nice jump on the ball if the offense waits that long. So that, that's kind of one of the things that you know you typically has played to the offensive advantage if they get a little extra time to get a playoff because now those guys might be second guessing that jump where they do have to start paying attention to the ball as opposed to paying attention to that play clock. But that's been something that you see once it gets to five, and this, that defense is kind of walking around getting ready to try to pressure a blitz. You know, as a quarterback, eventually they're going to present themselves. And so you can hold it as long as you want, but once it gets, it gets close to zero, you got to snap the football too. So you can only do so much to help out your offensive line discern who's blitzing, who's not, who might be dropping and showing their hand before the snap of the football. So it, it definitely helps to uh, to a degree. I'll be curious too to see how offenses obviously adjust to that with the change in the rule. No, for, for sure. I do think it's going to be fascinating to see how that all unfolds. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we have one more rule change that we want to get to and also some hot gossip that's going down in Florida. Take We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back.
The best couch potatoes come from Pluto TV country. And these taters, they like all sorts of different things. Survivor Channel, Ink Master Channel. If it's got a spaceship in it, I'm probably watching it. Three channels dedicated to CSI. Whatever mood you're in, it's going to be easy watching. And we'll touch on this one really quickly because I don't know if this rule change, there's a lot to unpack here, but the NFL did decide to move the trade deadline back a week. So this was proposed by the Steelers. They moved it. It was typically week eight. Now it's going to be week nine. Dues, does this have any crazy significance in the league or how do you see this trade deadline being moved in your mind? I think it's actually pretty big. Okay. Yeah, I, th- I think it's pretty big, Tyler, because we heard that the, the Baltimore Ravens last year were in talks to potentially trade for a guy like Derrick Henry, right, right around the trade deadline. So just imagine if they potentially had an extra week to maybe nail out the trade compensation and what it would cost to get Derrick Henry in. And then when you look at it, going to a 17-week schedule now, nine weeks puts you, like, right at the halfway point, essentially, depending on when teams have, you know, buys or not. So, like, you can see potentially maybe teams get a little bit more aggressive. Now, I don't think we'll see any NBA like trade deadline type trades, right? Because they the NBA has always been aggressive at the trade deadline. But I do think you'll see maybe a little bit more now, especially because, Brady, you know this, the longer you go on the season, the more apt there is to be injuries, right? So now with an extra week, if somebody does go down in a pivotal position, maybe there's a, a player that you could look at to trade for so you can continue your run. And that way there's not that much fall off. Yeah, I think it's interesting to move back to week nine. And that's uh, obviously me being a guy who anticipates the league going to an 18-game schedule at some point in time in the near future, especially as the league looks to continue to keep growing its revenue. That's one way of doing so. So as of right now, we look at it and go, oh, week eight to week nine, man, that's a little more than half the waypoint. Pump the brakes on that one. It will be once again the halfway point, but brings dues does bring up a good point in the sense that my concern is the teams start tanking. Do we start seeing teams, depending on how far we push this back, I know it was initially proposed to push it back to week 10. They set on a week nine. If you do get to that point that's you know past the halfway point, is there a fire sale? There, there are a bunch of teams that really aren't going to be competitive down the stretch uh, who end up kind of unloading players on their roster for some teams to make a playoff run and for those teams to load up for the draft for the following year and, and essentially try to find their way somewhere in the top 10, top five of the draft. So uh, I think that's the one concern you've got to have if you are the NFL uh, about pushing it back too far. And again, I don't know if we're quite there yet, but we're, we're definitely getting close. And I think we've seen more activity too around the trade deadline. The other thing that brings to mind as as there's some other topics around the NFL, for example, um, the NFL is looking at having a doubleheader on Christmas. Look, that used to be the NBA's like, you know, that was, that was their deal. That was their holiday. They put the best matchups, the biggest matchups on Christmas day. Now the NFL has infiltrated kind of uh, that holiday, if you will, for the NBA and kind of just blowing them out of the water. And I kind of see the trade deadline being pushed back as part of that because if I'm not mistaken, this is close to the beginning of the NBA season. So it it allows those conversations about potential trades and trade activity to continue to, to, to kind of take over during the course of the week in between those, you know, Thursdays and Sundays and Mondays where we've got games. So uh, this is just the NFL, in my mind, uh, taking another step in the direction of just trying to dominate every single professional sport out there with their storylines throughout the year, throughout the week, uh, not just on Sundays. Yeah, no, it's a 24-7 league. And yeah, you're right. This is going to be the Tuesday after the Week 9 games, which I think that puts you around October, November, right around the time the NBA starts back up again. And, you know, depending on what time of the year and how late the MLB calendar goes, you could probably bleed into the World Series as well. So they are very much aware, I think, of their power and their their power to get viewers and to take them away from anybody else. I think it's going to be fascinating. And I do think you're right. I do think it's somewhat of a correction to what they did when they changed the schedule to set 16 to 17 games. They never moved the trade deadline. You want to be kind of in the middle of the year. Even if you do go to 18 games, you'll pretty much be right smack dab in the middle of the season. So I do think that makes a lot of sense. The one thing that I do think that could be interesting, and I think you guys even touched upon it too, Dues, I'll let you get on this, is that the possibility for big trades, 
we have seen some players move. I mean, Christian McCaffrey moved around the trade deadline not too long ago. Huge impact for the San Francisco 49ers. A little bit of a, I guess, diff different circumstance, but ultimately still moved around the deadline. Do you believe we could see more big deals with it being pushed a little bit further? Or are you kind of on Brady's side where you might be concerned that they could lead to tanking and there's just kind of this unloading of players at the deadline? I think Brady brings up a really good point just because it's a week later on to the season and you kind of have some semblance of how the season is going. Now, again, it's almost at the halfway point of football and you can technically turn your season around. Uh, I think Christian McCaffrey, you made a great point, Tyler, was one of the big ones that we saw. We typically don't see frontline foundational pieces move during the trade deadline. That's why I brought up the NBA because that's usually what we see in the NBA, especially if a team isn't doing well and a, a star player kind of wants to force his way out. I think in this scenario, just because it's a week back, right, and I talked about potential injuries happening, you could see a, a few bigger names, to Brady's point, uh, teams that are not going to use a player. Like, perfect example, I brought up the Derrick Henry one. Like, they weren't going to, to the playoffs last year. There were talks about him being potentially traded. I think if the Ravens had one more week, they most likely would have made that trade. And who knows how that would have impacted – the Ravens on that run in the playoffs when they got to the AFC championship game. So I just think an extra week now allots teams uh, to, to potentially make a big quote unquote trade move for players. We saw Vaughn Miller was another big name, right? That that was traded at the trade deadline and made a, a, a monumental uh, 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 monumental was a monumental move for the Rams and also gave them a, a lift up as they, you know, made their run to the Super Bowl. So I just think with an extra week, and teams look at their roster and see how the schedule's going. If they're out of it, I think they could start on loading players. And I think teams that feel like they can actually make a run at a Super Bowl will be more aggressive now. Makes another day on the NFL calendar that much more interesting. We'll move on here towards a little bit more NFL draft centric topic. You know, it's the league meetings. We all talk about the owners, but there are head coaches there as well. And they're talking and they're talking about quarterbacks in the NFL draft. Several coaches provided a little bit of insight into their draft plan. So we're going to do a little read between the lines into what some of these coaches have said. We'll start with the team that has the number two overall pick. New head coach Dan Quinn said this, quote, it'd be a fit. It'd be fair to envision would be taking a quarterback to say where it'll happen. I think that's a better question for general manager, Adam Peters. So uh, Brady, is there any actual possibility that they trade out of the number two overall pick? Yeah, maybe up to number one, right? If you get a scenario where maybe the Chicago Bears uh, aren't as heavy in on <laughs> about it. Williams as Washington, I mean, that would be that'd be about it. I mean, I, I can't imagine that the the Washington Commanders would would trade back out of that and risk going into the season without one of the top quarterbacks in this year's draft class. So, uh, if anything, I'd be thinking maybe they're talking about trading up. Uh, to the number one spot. It wouldn't cost them that much to move up one spot. Uh, not quite the King's ransom we've seen in years past, or even the fact that the commander's organization has been a part of in previous years. So it's hard to believe right now. Uh, it's kind of that time of year where uh, you know how our, how I know your lines because your lips are moving. Uh, it's got to be, you got to be careful what you read from the tea leaves with the owner's meetings or anything really leading up to the draft at this point. Dues, what's your take? Yeah, to, to me, this is what do they call it, Brady and Tyler, being tongue in cheek. That's what Dan Quinn is doing right now. Like, there's no, absolutely no way they're not taking a quarterback at number two overall. To Brady's point, we know who the offensive coordinator is, right? He was USC's, he worked with Caleb Williams last year. So, if anything, they would maybe try to figure out how to move up to number one to get Caleb. I don't think Chicago is moving away from that pick no matter what. Um, but yeah, Dan Quinn, come on. What are you doing here? Dude, you're taking a quarterback number two overall. Yeah, I know. I know he's definitely lying. I mean, I think that's very clear and obvious. But let's just play the game here. Let's say that they do trade out of the number two overall pick. And is there a quarterback that you see Brady that could be in the back end of the first round where they could kind of, you know, not necessarily the obviously the Williams, the Daniels, the Mays, the McCarthy's. Is is the would Penix be that guy that's at the back end of the first round possibly that this type of team would target? Uh, potentially. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the, the big question about him is the medical, but sure. for me, you know, he would be the guy that I would take a good, long, hard look at because his play the last two years 
mimics a lot of what you saw from C.J. Stroud. I mean, elite accuracy from the pocket downfield. I think he moves well under pressure. I think the biggest thing working against him is the fact that he didn't play his best game in his last game. But outside of that, if you just take him for that one game, small sample size, you're going to miss out on his entire body of work. And he's a player that led Indiana to one of its best seasons ever. Uh, during the course of his time there, transferred to Washington, never really looked back and was one of the most prolific passers the past two years. So I think there's a lot to like about Michael Penix. Uh, you do have to get comfortable with uh, the fact that he's a left-handed quarterback. So the way you might configure your offense, call your offense is going to be flipped or different from a righty. Uh, a lot of people too get concerned about, hey, now your left tackle is not your blind side. Now he's your, your you know front side tackle. Uh, and your right tackle, you better feel good about. In today's NFL, you're going to have two good tackles because usually most teams have two good edge rushers. So that's not as big of a concern as I think as it used to be. Uh, but he'd be definitely a guy to take a look at. Bo Nix is another one. Uh, extremely accurate, well-prepared for the NFL level, had a litany of offensives that he went through from his time at Auburn to his time at Oregon as far as different play callers. So he'd be another guy that I think gets some consideration uh, based on his, you know, his trajectory and path throughout the course of his college career. And let's look at the Chargers now really quickly. They already already have a first-round quarterback in Justin Herbert with a just absolute ton of potential. It'll be fascinating to see how him and Jim Harbaugh pair up. But Harbaugh did bring up his former quarterback in Michigan's J.J. McCarthy, saying that he's the best quarterback in this draft. He plays quarterback the best of all the quarterbacks. He's a winner. So, Deuce, what do you think Harbaugh is actually trying to say here? Is he just trying to help out a former player? That's exactly what he's doing. And, and Harbaugh has been saying this since the beginning of, you know, these players finish, you know, their regular season and championship run. He's been saying J.J. McCarthy, as he should, right? It's his ex-coach. or not want to say ex-coach, his former coach. And he, he's landed on the line for his player. And that's what he should do, right? And also, I think he's fleecing people to try to come up to number five. And look at them being in cat purgatory. I think that's one team that could potentially move back now, just knowing Jim Harbaugh and, the way he he thinks on the football field, uh, it's it's going to be hard for him to move off that number five spot because you know Brady's got a a guy that that went to his school that's a really good tackle there, and we could see him potentially take him and move him to right tackle, and now they got bookend tackles probably for the next what eight to ten years, Brady. So it, it'll be hard for him to pass that up. But when you also look at their their team, they need some cheap labor, Brady, right there in cap purgatory. So uh, they, they want to get some guys for cheaper, and the only way to do that is to move back in the draft because. What the number five pick is getting paid compared to what the number 11 pick get, gets paid is, is a lot different. So uh, I could see them potentially moving out of that spot. But to me, Tyler, this is just a coach looking out for his young player, trying to maximize his value in the draft and, and have him go as high as possible. And also what this does, Brady, it makes Jim Harbaugh look good if he has a quarterback that goes in the top three or four picks, right? You have that on your resume. He could add that to not only being a national champion uh coach but also a coach that's been able to turn programs around really quick so now you add uh, you know i coach a top five quarterback looks really good on your resume yeah look i think he knows his quarterback in this draft class better than anyone else in regards to jj mccarthy and what he had over the course of his tenure at michigan so uh do we expect him to talk highly about his former quarterback who helped him win multiple big 10 championships and a national championship of course but i also think there's a, a fair amount of honesty too because I think there's been some questions about J.J. McCarthy within the Michigan offense and what he was asked to do or not asked to do for that matter. And I think Jim Harbaugh is out there trying to kind of correct the narrative and saying, like, look, we didn't need to uh, open up J.J. McCarthy to do a bunch of different things. I mean, if anyone looked at their personnel, too, at Michigan, that really wasn't what they leaned on in recruiting and development anyway. It was their offensive line, their running backs, tight ends. When they asked J.J. McCarthy to make throws, he made throws. There's, there's in instances of him having to compete in shootouts and showcasing the ability to make throws when the pressure was on. So I think there's a lot of honesty in what he's saying. You can see it if you if you break down, watch his tape. I had the opportunity to be around the team a lot this year. And I think he also touches on a lot of the intangibles that teams are looking for in a guy, by the way, who's not like you know Bo Nix or Michael Penix or uh, some of the other quarterbacks that we're talking about in this draft class who are much older too and have played a lot of college football at this point. Uh, Jaden Daniels, for example, too. He's a player who's a little bit younger, a little bit greener, but maybe that's not such a bad thing because they do feel like there's so much more upside for him as compared to a guy who's 24 years old, might be more of a finished product coming into the NFL. 
I, I think all things can be true, right? I think he can be talking up his player, you know, kind of dispelling a notion about his former program at Michigan. But I also think he recognizes that this is a quarterback class that a lot of teams are gearing up to possibly trade up for, whether it's Minnesota, even talk about possibly New York. They, they have the number six overall pick. Maybe they kind of leapfrog a little bit. I think he's either trying to A, create some draft buzz for his team to get some more draft capital to move down, as you were saying, dudes. Or if a team bumps up and wants to go to the number four overall pick with the Arizona Cardinals, well, guess who falls to Justin Herbert? Marvin Harrison Jr., which is a phenomenal development for that offense who just lost Mike Williams and Keenan Allen. So I, it, there's just a lot of layers here. I think all those things can specifically be true, but but let's get a little crazy, right? Let, let's just get absolutely wild. Let's say that Jim Harbaugh absolutely loves J.J. McCarthy and he wants him as his quarterback for the Los Angeles Chargers. Is there any scenario where that happens? I know financially that probably can't happen. I think the dead cap hit was like $100 million for Justin Herbert, but dudes, <laughs> would, would, this, would this be absolutely insane to think? Yeah, I don't think there's any possible way that Jim Harbaugh trades away Chuck Herbert. Not only the dead cap, but it's just like I don't think Jim Harbaugh's ever had a quarterback with the talent that Justin Herbert has had. So just imagine Jim Harbaugh being able to de- – I mean, I would say develop him because he's still a pretty young player, develop him into being a winning quarterback. Because that, That's been the, the knock on Justin Herbert, right? He hasn't been able to get over the top. They were up by multiple touchdowns in that, that playoff game versus Jacksonville, and they all came crumbling down in the second half. Last year, he got banged up when a lot of people thought that team would maybe even push the Kansas City Chiefs for, you know, the AFC West crown. So that's been the knock on them. And, and nobody, and we talked about this earlier, Brady, nobody can turn around a program quicker than Jim Harbaugh, right? So people were wondering how Justin Herbert would feel in that offense because he's probably not going to ask him to throw 40 times a game, right? They're going to run the football. But I think that also will protect Justin Herbert where you can see some of that arm talent come out only when you need it, right? It's not like he has to go out there and put up 35 points a game because Jim Harbaugh is going to lean on that defense. He's going to lean on the run game. That's where he's done it. Every program he's been at, whether it's University of San Diego, whether it's San Francisco, whether it's Michigan, they are going to run the football and play physical good defense. And that's what they're going to do with the uh, Chargers. So now with Justin Herbert, you feel like it's not as much pressure on you, right? You're not going to have to do everything by yourself because you have a coach that's going to put a plan in place that when we need that big arm that's been blessed by the gods, we're going to bring it out. We're going to use it, but I'm not going to go out there and ask you to throw 45 times a game. I'll bite Solly. I'll go ahead and play crazy with you here. Um, It would be amazing. Like like, there's a thought too, that I'm like, well, if you do love him so much, you could just draft him at number five. If he ends up being there. Right. Uh, And then you just look at maybe trading Justin Herbert and, and seeing the bounty of picks you would get for Justin Herbert because you would still have some suitors out there, right? Like we're if that, if that ended up being the case, okay, that means we probably saw quarterbacks go one, two, three, and JJ McCarthy was not one of them. So that's three quarterback needy teams that are now off the board. But that still leaves you Denver. It still leaves you Las Vegas. It still leaves you Minnesota. So you would have three suitors right there that you could potentially deal off your quarterback to. Now the finances, I'm not going to get into that because again, we're playing crazy here, okay. It's like when I ask my wife to go on a shopping spree, uh, there's just no limit to what she's, what damn she's <laughs> going to do. But what, what I'm saying here is, yeah, there's a world where it's crazy can exist world. and we can play this scenario, right, where maybe a team's willing to mortgage the next three first-round picks, a second-round pick. Who knows the bounty of picks they could get? And if you're Jim Harbaugh and you're in this rebuild mode, why not sit there and say, well, I know what I'm getting with this quarterback from the college days. He's going to know the offense day one. And if we're rebuilding the first year anyway – why not get younger, cheaper if possible with that rookie quarterback and then try to get a slew of picks back for it? So again, crazy idea. Definitely probably not going to happen, but it's still fun to entertain and think about the fact that there would be a number of suitors out there that would have to potentially put together a pretty big trade package. Let's not forget too, Minnesota has loaded up on some draft picks. So, I mean, you'd at least would think you'd get two of their first round draft picks this year alone that they've already accumulated. Yeah, no, it would certainly be one of the biggest uh, trades in NFL history in terms of the package. And yes, the popsicle headache of the finances, I don't necessarily want to jump on. But real quickly, let's do Sean Payton and the Broncos. You know, we're talking about quarterbacks here. They might be a little bit too far down the list to maybe acquire one. Obviously got rid of Russell Wilson. But here's what he said. Realistic, 
the Broncos to move up in the 2024 NFL draft. It's going to it's good to be the Cardinals general manager, Monty Awesome Fort, right now. So he's already kind of tipping his hand that they possibly could move up. Do you see them, dudes, real quickly moving up to the number four overall pick to possibly take a quarterback? I don't know if they actually have the firepower when you look at teams like Minnesota or the Raiders that could potentially move in front of them to to make a aggressive move to try to get maybe a J.J. McCarthy or if a Drake May passes, you know, pick four or five. I just I just don't I think this is a rebuild year. I mean, they're on the hook for so much money because of Russell Wilson. This could be a scenario where it's almost like a tear it down type year and try to rebuild next year right once you get you know russell's money's off the books and you know they they, because of the extra 30 million dollars they felt a lot more comfortable taking that hit from russell wilson because they're they were afforded more money to put into that dead cap hit so uh, i just i just think sean payton is talking uh being tongue-in-cheek again now again they could be aggressive i just don't foresee it happening i could see them potentially taking a filler on a you know a quarterback later on in the draft brady where are you yeah, I don't know if they have the draft capital without mortgaging the long-term future of things. And I'm kind of curious to think uh, or to see what the new ownership group thinks of Sean Payton. Um, they've moved on from Russell Wilson, so they've given Sean Payton his wish. But now they find themselves in this precarious situation where they're trying to clean up their own cap situation. Large, A large part will be being paid to Russell Wilson this year. And then build back this roster to be a contender in a division in which you play with the defending two-time Super Bowl champ. So... Uh, it's a tough spot to be in. Um, you know, is Jared Stidham going to be the guy this year? He looks like he's in that pole position right now, but there's some veterans out there they could get, and maybe Denver takes a flyer on a guy in the second round that they really like if they find themselves in that spot, uh, or, or maybe in the first round. You know, maybe they, they do what some people believe would be overdrafting a quarterback in that spot. Who knows? But uh, Sean Payton's in a tough spot, and I think it'd be great to think they could move all the way up, but in years past, we've seen teams really pay a premium to move that far up to be able to take a quarterback. And are you willing to do that for what would be assumed to be the fourth best quarterback, this draft class, at least based on how the, the one, two, three would go. And again, that would be a first. We've never seen four quarterbacks go one, two, three, four before. Uh, I'm not sure this is going to be the year it happens. And it also kind of takes some like pre-draft jockeying to collect more picks. Like we saw with Minnesota to even position yourself to possibly make that type of move. So I, I agree with you. I think it'd be tough for Denver to kind of vault that highly in the NFL draft. All right, that'll do it for this show. On Thursday, the Super Friends are back to wrap up the league meetings and discuss the effects of everything that went on. Remember to like, comment, subscribe on our YouTube page. For everyone listening to audio only, make sure you download, follow, and leave a five-star review. And tell your friends to listen and watch the podcast.